All right, we will go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Hello, friends and new friends. I see so many familiar names um, here, and I wish we had the camera option so we could see all of your beautiful faces. Um, this morning, we are so excited to chat with you all about rethinking kinship licensing. As you all may know, as kinship professionals, the federal government came out with new guidance recently um, that states should basically have separate, simpler, and faster licensing process for kinship foster parents. At Foster Kinship, we've worked with over 10,000 kinship families, and we really wanted to identify what levels of support at what time led to the most stable outcomes for kiddos that are living in kinship foster care. So we looked at a range of different interventions that are utilized through our data, as well as through uh, data from Clark County Department of Family Services. And what we found was really interesting. So today, myself, uh, Dr. Caliendo and Paula Ramirez will be talking more about that. Um, I'm Leah Dodds. I am the Strategic Programs Director at Foster Kinship. Um, I've worked in pretty much all positions here at Foster Kinship, and now I oversee our expansion with our evidence-based model to other jurisdictions, as well as focusing on internal and external policy work. I also have Dr. Caliendo, who is our fearless leader, our founder and executive director. Um, she created Foster Kinship um, because she was working with kiddos in a therapeutic role, um, for kids that are in foster care and really found disparities between kiddos in kinship care and kiddos in traditional foster care. And so she founded Foster Kinship to really fill in those gaps. She is a kinship and child welfare policy expert um, and created our evidence-based model that we use to stabilize families. And then last but not least, we have Paula Ramirez, who is our Kinship Navigator Program Manager. She oversees um, the work that all of our family advocates do to keep kiddos stable. Um, she is a licensed social worker and a certified drug and alcohol counselor here in Nevada. Um, she basically supports our inner workings with our programs. We serve about 100 new families per month and on average about 600 families month after month that are returning to us to um, get services to maintain stability. So today we'll go over what we're going to talk about and then I will pass it off to Paula. Um, so we're gonna give you a little overview about foster kinship, what our navigation services look like, we are going to take you through what the process is to become a kinship foster parent here in Clark County. And then we're going to start to answer the question of like what levels of support provide the most stable home for kiddos in kinship foster care. We'll share our findings through data, through practice, um, years of practice and data um, to hopefully present to you some strategies um, that are going to be practical, but will increase equity, stability, and well-being of kids in kinship foster care. Um, and then our plan to rethink kinship licensing to, again, keep kids stable and hopefully have them leave the system better than when they came into the system. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Paula Ramirez to talk more about foster kinship and our navigator model. Thank you so much, Leah, and thank you all for joining us today. So I'm going to begin with an overview about foster kinship. I'll get more in depth on our programs, and then we'll shift into the conversation of licensing. Um, so Leah touched on some of these points already, but foster kinship is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We were founded in 2011 by Dr. Caliendo. As Leah mentioned, you know, Dr. Caliendo noticed that there was a huge disparity in services with kinship families and children living in non-parental care. Here in Nevada, there are approximately 30,000 children living in kinship care. And so Foster's Kinship's mission is really to make sure that caregivers have the capacity to provide safe, stable, and nurturing homes for these children. And we also mentioned that to date, we have served over 10,000 families. And really the core of all of the work we do is making sure that families are able to break generational cycles of abuse neglect and trauma to make sure that children can experience a more vibrant future. 
So on the next slide, I'm going to be talking about our four main programs. First is our Kinship Navigator program, which I currently manage. And so our Navigator program is an evidence-based family stabilization model. We have three main core functions. So the first one is our helpline, which is essentially how families and community agencies can get in touch with us via phone or email, and it is statewide. So we provide general information and resources via our helpline. Our second function of the Navigator program is our intake services. So we complete comprehensive intake assessments with every family that reaches out to us. And that really allows us to understand what type of kinship family they are and then what type of resources they're eligible for. And from there, we can pair that family with a family advocate and receive case management services so that they can get really comprehensive and tailored case planning that's specific to the needs that they have and the goals that they're hoping to accomplish. So that's our Navigator program in a nutshell. Next is our Marcy's Heart, which is our on-site resource center. So we have a section at our office that makes sure that families have access to all of the items that they need on a daily basis for their kiddos. So that's clothes, shoes, diapers, cribs, anything that they need to make sure that they can provide um, a safe home on a daily basis. And Marcy's Heart helps families in three main ways. The first way is through emergency resources. So these are the items that are really critically needed on a daily basis. So diapers, wipes, car seats, clothes for kiddos. Um, so we make sure that families have access to these tangible goods in a really efficient um, and accessible manner. The second way Marcy's Heart helps families is through caregiver corner markets. And so this is, we actually have a section of our uh, resource center that is designed to be like a store. And this is really intentional so that we can make sure that our adults and our teenagers are also getting support. So they can sign up for a time slot where they come in and shop for items themselves. And the store is designed really intentionally to be very hospitable and a little bit of retail therapy for families so that they can take care of themselves as well. And then the third way that Marcy's Heart helps families is through holiday assistance. So any holiday that we're able to help families with, we do. So that's distributing, you know, gifts at Christmas time, Easter baskets, uh, costumes for Halloween, Thanksgiving boxes, any way that we can really make sure that they're taken care of during the holiday seasons. And then third, our third program is our Kinship Training Institute. And so this program provides specialized training and, edu and education to families and community partners and professionals. Um, a large segment of our Kinship Training Institute provides trauma-informed training. It's grounded in TBRI, which stands for Trust-Based Relational Intervention, which is a promising practice that basically makes sure that caregivers have the tools that they need to effectively parent children who've experienced abuse and neglect. So we do provide a TBRI training series as well as individual consultations and different workshops that are grounded in TBRI principles that really help families with big behaviors um, and make sure that kids are receiving parenting that is effective for their needs. And then the other large segment of our institute includes our child welfare training. And so we're going to get a lot more in depth about the child welfare training in a few slides, but essentially the requirements that families in Clark County have to complete to become licensed kinship foster parents, we provide the training services for that. So that includes 15 hours of pre-service classes as well as CPR and car seat and a couple of other trainings like normalcy and LGBTQ. And then lastly, we have our Child and Youth Interventions Program, which provides a range of different services for kiddos. So this is where we work directly with our children and our youth. And we have different services that are really tailored to children's de developmental ages, as well as their needs. Uh, for example, we have a Coven Tots program that is really geared towards pre-K respite. So it helps prepare our youth for kindergarten. Um, and it also, you know, it offers caregivers an opportunity 
opportunity to take a break and care for themselves. And then of course we have our general respite option that is available for all of our families where they can coordinate a time with our child care specialists and they can bring their kiddos to our facility. And then they get that time, the caregivers get that time back for themselves. And you know, it may be for a doctor's appointment, it may be for groceries or it may just be for a nap. It does not matter to us, but we just wanna make sure that they have the opportunity um, to have some time back for themselves. And then on the next slide, so I'm going to go more in depth with our Kinship Navigator program. As I mentioned, this is an evidence-based family stabilization model. So we provide our helpline intake and case management services with our Navigator program. And when families come to us for case management, we are really assessing them across four domains that you can see here. First is legal capacity. So we want to look at what legal options does the family have. So that may be legal guardianship, it may be adoption, or in some cases licensing. And so whichever one of those options is available to them, we provide in-depth assistance in helping them accomplish that. Our next one is financial stability. So again, we screen families for every possible resource. So oftentimes we're helping families apply for cash assistance, child-only TANF, food assist assistance through SNAP, um, energy assistance, childcare, anything that we can bring in to make sure that they have more resources. And our family advocates provide one-on-one -on -one application assistance so that we make sure we're screening their eligibility for these services, helping them fill out the paperwork and collect the documents, and then even helping them complete the interview with, you know, say welfare to make sure that they can get these resources. Third is our parent um, and child community connection. So this is where we're making sure that families have external and internal referrals. So internally, we can refer families to our other host of programs that I touched upon in the last slide. So we connect them with our child and youth program, making sure families know that we can offer them respite. We have youth support groups. We offer behavioral consultations. So making sure that the caregiver has everything that they need to safely and effectively raise their kiddo. And then we also look to see what does the child need. And so maybe they need mental health referrals. Maybe they need assistance getting those assessments completed, um, you know, maybe navigating the school system. So whatever it may be, we look to see how can we can help them internally and then get them connected externally. And then lastly is caregiver emotional support, which we know is absolutely critical for our families and really has a huge impact on our outcomes. And so we provide a range of different emotional support services, and that includes just the one-on-one -on -one interactions that we have with families throughout the journey of their case plan. But we also have more structured activities. We have um, quite a few different support groups for our caregivers. Um, we also have individual behavioral consultations, mental health service navigation, and then I mentioned earlier respite, which we know is, you know, can be very helpful for families who may otherwise not get a break at all. So um, we make sure that the caregiver also has as much support as possible. So those are the four domains that we look at with every single family that comes through our navigator program to make sure that we're really comprehensively supporting them. And um, just to highlight, our navigator program is a promising practice. So we had two external evaluations conducted and that data revealed that families who utilize our navigation services are more likely to access supportive services, including licensing and child-only TANF, and they're also less likely to disrupt. So that's really pivotal that, you know, children are staying safe with their family and preventing traditional foster care with strangers or, or change of placements. So this framework kind of uh, encapsulates everything that I had highlighted in a really nice framework that shows you when a family comes to us, we are helping them get connected to every single one of our services. So again, we're looking at how we can help them in our navigator program. We're making sure that they're getting tangible goods through Marcy's Heart Resource Center. We're providing them trainings and parenting education in our institute working directly with their youth and our child and youth interventions. And then we also 
also do a lot of policy work as well. We do have groups that are for youth as well as caregivers to make sure that there is a space and a platform for the entire kinship family to advocate for their needs on a, on a policy uh, level. And so through all of this, again, it's all of the services that we provide are rooted in our mission of making sure that families are safe, stable, and nurturing, which ultimately then can forge a pathway for generational healing. Okay, so that was the general overview of foster kinship in our program. So now I'm gonna switch into focusing a bit more on licensing. So we're gonna be talking about the licensing process in Clark County for a family to become a licensed kinship foster parent. So generally speaking, I'm going to first review the main six criteria that a family has to meet to go through the licensing process, and then I will go more specifically into what the, the process looks like when they're working with us. So for a family, first is a detailed universal application. So we are helping them fill out an application that provides essentially information about their household and the family's background to ensure that they are safe and able to become licensed. Number two, families also have to provide quite a few different documents on their households. This is anywhere from IDs to social security guards all the way to um, vaccines for their pets and shot records for children in their home who are not in the foster care system, um, marriage certificates, divorce decrees. So there's a, a good variety of documents that families do have to provide in this process. Families do also have to get fingerprinted, and that includes all adults who live in their home. And so they do get fingerprinted twice in this process, once at the time of placement, and then again for the purposes of licensing. Families also have to complete the 15 hours of pre-service trainings with us, as well as CPR and car seat, and then also getting a physical with a physician and getting tested for TB. So that is a fairly high level overview of the six um, main pieces of criteria that families have to accomplish to go through the process to become a licensed kinship foster parent in Clark County. So the way that we currently work with families, you can see that there is one through eight steps. So first, we receive placement referrals from the Department of Family Services on a weekly basis, letting us know all of the caregivers who took placement of a relative child or fictive kin the week prior. So we complete outreach to all of these families. And so first we invite families to attend an information session so that they can really get introduced to the idea of licensing because oftentimes most families have never heard of it or don't really know what it entails. So the information session um, provides a good orientation for them. It also provides an overview of the Child Welfare Agency and lets them know um, the general requirements to see if that's something they're interested in pursuing. So from there, if they are interested, then we get them um, set up for an intake assessment with one of our family advocates, again, to do a pretty comprehensive assessment of any services that they're eligible for but also going more specifically into licensing. And we speak, you know, really clearly with families about all of the pros and cons about licensing and encourage families to do it because we know that yields the most supportive services for them. From there, if families are eligible for licensing and interested, we get them paired up with a family advocate case manager who can really provide that one-on-one -on -one in depth assistance to get them through the process and meet those six criteria that I mentioned. So families, we enroll them in our pre-service classes that are facilitated in-house by our team members. So we make sure that they're signed up for a series to complete the 15 hours, which are facilitated um, once a week for five weeks and they're three hours long. In addition to that, we're making sure that they're getting signed up for CPR and car seat and we're helping them collect all of the documents that they need for the process. 
From there, once families have completed all of those steps, they've completed their licensing, we have, have all of their documents, they've done their TB and physical testing, we then submit essentially a completed file back to the Department of Family Services, who then reviews the file, and then a licensing worker can complete a home study with the family to inspect their home for safety. And if all of that goes well, then they become a licensed kinship foster parent in Clark County. And at that point, they're eligible to begin receiving the reimbursement. So I'm going to talk about the a little bit more about the pre-service classes. But before I jump into that, I have a note that I kind of want to make on um, about the full process that families go through with us. Um, it can be really hard for families. We know that, you know, licensing comes at the time that they are getting, that they've just gotten placement. It is, the family's going through a lot of emotional turmoil and caregivers have made really significant changes in their lives to make sure that they can provide a safe and stable home for, you know, their relatives, kiddos. And so families have a lot emotionally going on. So then when we're also talking about all all of the steps that are required for licensing, it can be daunting, it can feel very overwhelming. Um, you know, initially it seems that perhaps the, the 15 hours of pre-service classes is the most difficult, but ironically we find that that's actually not where families struggle. Um, a lot of, the majority of families who opt into licensing finish those classes. Where we find that families are, get, you know, struggle or get frustrated is actually all of the different types of documents that they have to complete and getting their physical and TB testing. Um, the documents are pretty invasive. Sometimes families don't have those documents. They have to request them, pay for them, do quite a bit of work to gather that. And so I just wanted to you know, kind of share that observation that ironically, it, the classes are not the, the difficulty for families. It's all the additional pieces where we can see that families struggle to get through the licensing process. So with that being said, I will shift gears to focus more specifically on these pre-service classes that I've mentioned a couple of times. So in Clark County, as I've mentioned, there's five classes. They're offered once a week for three hour segments each. And we make sure that the, the curriculum goes through a variety of topics to, to help caregivers get trained and receive that specialized education so that they feel that they're equipped to care for the children um, in their home and really understand the process that they're going through. So class number one is really focused on just providing an orientation to families. We provide an overview of the child welfare agency because oftentimes families don't even really understand the experience that they're going through. And so we make sure that we can provide the education and give them a literal roadmap to show them what, you know, where they're at now and some of the possibilities for the road ahead. So class one is a lot of just that orientation and helping them understand what kinship care means and the child welfare agency that they're working with. Class two then goes deeper into grief and loss. Um, it's really focused on the child's perspective, the child or youth, um, because we want, you know, families to really understand what the children are going through in this process of not being able to be with their parents and, um, you know, changing their home. It's a lot. So it's focused on grief and loss, um, children's attachment, and then also the role of the caregiver. So how they can be really supportive to children and youth through this process. Class three then goes more in depth into the impacts of trauma, abuse, and neglect on children. So again, two, um, class two into class three is just providing that trauma-informed perspective for families to understand how, you know, what they're experiencing as the caregiver and then also what their kiddos are experiencing. Class four then talks more about boundaries and shared parenting. So this is where we speak more about the role of parents, the role of caregiver, and the role of the children, and how they can, the caregiver can implement some healthy boundaries and also hopefully work on shared parenting with parents. 
And then lastly, class five covers permanency, normalcy, and LGBTQ training. So we review some possible permanency outcomes for families and, you know, what could be happening at, um, with their specific situation. And as I mentioned, normalcy and LGBTQ to make sure that caregivers are also informed on those topics. So all together, we want to make sure that families get a comprehensive training package that they feel more knowledgeable about the experience they're having and they have the tools that they need to provide a really safe, stable, nurturing home for the children in their care. So with that, I'm now going to pass it over to Dr. Caliendo. Thank you, Paula and Leah. And I'm really excited to dig into data now from our evaluation that hopefully will shed some light on how to help us all think about building equity for kinship caregivers who are caring for kids in foster care while not losing some of the things that caregivers also say they need. And after working with thousands of families, um, we share some of the concerns that other direct kinship practitioners have shared with regards to the new federal, um, basically loosening of the potential rules for kin we are very excited about the opportunity that states have to design something that is appropriate for kinship families and does not make them jump through unnecessary hoops. But at the same time in our work with literally thousands of families, we know that kinship families, it's not just about the money in terms of what helps families stabilize. Um, it's a critical part of stabilization but it's not the only piece. And so rethinking licensing where we used to have sort of as it's been described as stick to get families into some training that is useful. And now thinking through how do we get families the information they need without requiring it and holding money up as part of the process. I think that's been the challenge that at Foster Kinship we've been thinking about really since September, if not sooner of last year. Um, how do we do this? Because families say they need money. Families say they want training. Families, uh, definitely, if love was enough to deal with the trauma in their home, no kinship family would need our services. So we know that there is a need for a combination of intervention for kinship families, especially when we think about kinship being not just a prevention from foster care, but that true intervention for children who can't live with their parents. How do we ensure that prioritizing kinship care is also prioritizing better outcomes for kids? Uh, so these are really big, complicated questions, and we had an evaluation done which looked at data from 2016 to 2019, and it was every single kinship placement in Clark County. Um, you can go back because I'll um, get to that in a second, Leah, um, but it's every single placement, and what we were looking at is does our navigator program lower the chance that families will disrupt because stability is such a huge part of our work. We wanted to see does it actually work? And yes, as Paula said, it does work. We know that families who use navigator services compared to families who do not um, are three times less likely to disrupt, which means kids are staying in their family. They're not going into traditional foster care with strangers. And that's a really good thing. But with the, um, in light of these new regulations where it's basically allowing foster um, agencies and states to think about dropping some of the requirements we started worrying a little bit about, well, if we drop training completely, will we lose anything in terms of that stability piece? So if families are just receiving the financial support from our system, but they're not also receiving some training, will that impact the stability of children over the long term? Finances will help in the short term stabilize families, but long term, we know behavior and family dynamics and child needs, all of those things can start to wear on family stability. And without some training, will it make it worse? So we looked at our data set again from 2016 to 2019, and I realized we had data not just on families who served or who used Navigator, but we also could pull data on every single family who had attended training. And then we also had data from the agency if they got licensed or got reimbursed. Um, so we could basically try to piece it together. Um, what is the impact of training versus getting paid versus navigator, a combination of all three? We're looking at um, families who received all services, and that's the navigator program as described already, the training program that we described, and they finished licensing, which is an intense process with the agency. 
We're looking at families who bypass foster kinship navigator altogether and just simply did the training and reimbursement piece. Then we're looking at families who only did training, they never finished licensing, but they also received navigator services. And then families who decided not to get licensed, they just received navigator services. Finally, comparing it to families who got no services whatsoever, just business as usual with our child welfare system. Um, and that's sort of what we're gonna describe. And one thing that's important to note is that in Clark County, um, licensing is optional, it's not mandatory. And so a lot of family, they don't, they're not forced to become licensed. Um, but if they do choose to become licensed, they do have to finish the training. So those are just things to keep in mind as we look into the data. And now we can go to the next slide, please. And this is going to be um, data from all over 3,000 children who were in kinship care between 2016 and 2019. We also know that um, about 15% of those kids were in homes that ended up disrupting, um, and that's the 469. And that's the number we like to focus on because we're all about stability. Um, so we're looking at which families received no support, navigator only, navigator and training, only training and reimbursement, so no, um, no foster kinship, and then all services. And we ran cross tabs on this data. So um, we're looking at descriptive cross tab data, and then we're going to break it down by kids who were in foster care for a short period of time, less than four months, versus kids who needed to be in foster care for four months or longer. Um, of those, we see about 45% of children will have some sort of end to foster care um, within four months, 45% of those, and then 55% of kids who come into care will be there for 120 days or four months or longer. Next slide. Okay, so this is, this is the exciting part for me, and this is where I tend to lose people. So, um, but I think what's really important is um, that we need to look at kids who are in foster care for short versus long-term, that becomes really important in terms of the timing of intervention. So first of all, as I told you, all kinship placements um, in all categories, they disrupt about 15% of the time. So that's the average overall. In general, adding any service um, combined with navigator services to these placements will reduce disruption. And in both cases, short and long-term placements, you'll see that only navigator services tend to dis reduce disruption actually quite a bit. Um, and then you'll see the bars kind of go up when you're looking at families who are receiving training and navigator or training and reimbursement without navigator. The disruption rate actually goes up substantially. Um, and we thought a lot about why that might be. Why are families who are receiving these services at the beginning uh, more likely to disrupt? And we know from Paula that the licensing process is intense and burdensome and training is part of that process. Um, and so what we found is if it's a short-term placement, families who are kind of jammed into the licensing process are far more likely to disrupt twice as likely, 31% of those placements disrupt. That is shocking. <laughs> um, but for families who are end up being long-term placements, so the ones that are gonna do this, the kids are there longer, really adding training reimbursement um, does not increase the risk of disruption. And of all services, when we're able to provide all services, navigation, training, and reimbursement to families, the disruption rate overall goes down and certainly for long-term placements goes down to just under 3%, which is much better than 15% average. Um, so really what we're seeing is that navigator services in general will help reduce the risk of disruption. But for some families, adding training and the licensing process early on actually increases the risk of disruption. What this means is we're thinking through new regulations is that we we want families to get trained because we we really believe that the training is valuable. And in fact, kinship families tell us training is valuable. 99% of the thousands of families who have taken the training rate it five out of five and say they would take it again. However, we also asked families recently, hey, would you take this training if it wasn't mandatory, sort of something you were forced to do as part of the process? And 88% of our families said no. They wouldn't actually have taken it if it wasn't mandatory. But almost 100% of the families in that same survey said, but once we were done with it, we would have required it for ourselves. 
So they found it very valuable, but they would not have taken it if it wasn't mandatory. So this puts us in like a huge conundrum of how do we make sure families get what they say they want, but they won't themselves know ahead of time that they need it unless it was mandatory. We haven't fully figured it out, but we're working on it. Um, we're working on it <laughs> because we know that training is valuable. But what I do think we need to think about as professionals when we're rethinking licensing, maybe forcing too much at the beginning when families are in crisis, when they're um, that you know, already have dealing with the family dynamics, the child's in their home, they're just trying to figure out how to survive, adding too many regulatory things at the beginning, even if we know it helps in the long run, is going to increase the chance that the family might say, you know what, I just can't do this. This is way too much. Um, I didn't ask for all of this. I just said yes to this child. So we need to be really careful when we think about um, the timing of training, but it's very clear that training and financial support and navigator services all together will certainly reduce disruption for most families and um, the families who have to care for children more than four months, it's just a huge reduction in disruption. So next slide, please. So we just shared data that was from our study from 2016 to 2019. We also wanna share what has foster kinship been doing since 2019 to try to increase the licensing rate under our current standards of licensing is very burdensome. Um, so we have started a program where we're working hand in hand with our child welfare agency to try to increase the licensure rate. We started this at the end of 21. Um, we're still currently doing and the baseline of licensing before we started partnering about 17%, I believe, of families uh, finished licensing. And again, it's optional, but nobody is satisfied with 17% of kinship placements being licensed especially because Clark County has almost half of our families now um, uh, caring for kids in foster care or kin. So it's a huge population and we wanna see the licensing rate go up because licensing means more support and we know that it improves outcomes for kids. So here's another um, just quick data set of about over a thousand families, which we have final disposition data, which just means we know what happened to them by the end um, of those families. 21% of families just are they're choosing nothing. They're saying we want no help, no services from the agency, from foster kinship. We don't want you to be involved in our lives. We don't want more agency involvement. Um, and the reasons for that can be, maybe the parents are still in the home or maybe the, they thought this will be short, kids are going home soon. Um, but of those families, we know families who receive no services at all are way more likely to disrupt. Um, families who receive zero support services disrupt 19 or 20% of the time compared to the 15. So those families are at higher risk. Of the families who do want support, um, when we reach out to contact, a lot of those families, when we describe the process of licensing, they don't want to be licensed. They said they're not interested in licensing, but they did want other types of support. So 34% just straight out said no to the licensing option. Um, the reasons that they said they didn't want to be licensed, again, families don't want more and more and more government involvement in their life. They're, they're choosing less. Um, maybe the parents are in the home and some of those options aren't possible. They said they don't need financial reimbursement. And so it's not worth it to go through all of these hoops because they're financially stable. Um, or maybe they're already receiving a different form of financial payment for their household or for their child and being licensed wouldn't fundamentally change the financial picture for them. So those are that 34% that are engaging in getting help but don't want licensing. Um, and then we have another 30% that say yes to licensing but don't finish the process. And we have some detailed data on why they drop off. A lot of the times it's reunification, Kids are transitioning to a, a different kinship homes. Of course, we have our disruption issue. And then we have, you know, a potential investigation in the kinship home where kids are running away. So finally, we get to our sort of funneled down families who say yes to help and yes to licensing. Um, and that was 290 or 29% of families completed all the licensing requirements and were able to, um, to go over to the licensing side of things at our agency. Um, at the Department of Family Services, not foster kinship. We don't do the final licensing, just to be clear. Um, so with all of this work, and we're talking like a lot of investment poured into families, yes, we see the licensing rate increase, but from 17% to a max 29%, that still doesn't feel 
good enough, right? I don't think anyone is satisfied with that. We want to see all families supported. And this drop-off rate was really surprising to us as well. Families just don't necessarily want to go through this licensing process, or if they do, things happen before they get through it um, that make it so they don't receive the benefit of going through the process. What is important to note is that even families who choose not to go through licensing, of all the families working with us, 74% um, got connected to welfare benefits. So that could be um, food stamps through SNAP or child-only TANF, or we have something called fictive kin TANF in Nevada. So next slide, please, Leah. Um, what this shows us is that our families who are unlicensed, who are not licensed, which we're all worried about, if only 29% of our homes are licensed, what about all these other ones? The majority of these unlicensed households are getting supported. They're actively working with the Navigator program. They're getting connected to welfare benefits. They're choosing the level of support that they want. Um, and so we're finding that it's still reducing disruption rate, even if they're not getting licensed. So there's that impact of just Navigator services alone. Some families are satisfied with just the impact and intervention of support and navigation. They don't want the whole licensing. They're not receiving training um, and they're still able to have the reduction, the reduction in disruption. Next slide. So when we look at disruptions, why are families disrupting? Um, well, there's a couple of things that are important to know. First of all, yes, unlicensed families disrupt way more often than licensed families. 94% um, of disruptions are unlicensed kinship families. But again, the majority of kinship families are unlicensed. Another thing to look at is fictive kin. Fictive kin, which are families who are not blood related to the child, they have a higher rate of disruption compared to a lower percentage of placement. And we've noted this trend for years. Um, and we believe that fictive kin disrupt at levels more uh, comparable to traditional foster care. And this could simply be because if you are a maternal grandma, you might be far less likely to disrupt on your grandchild then the neighbor who stepped up and thought that there would be help and support, and it turns out there you know, wasn't coming as fast as it needed to be, and it just isn't possible to maintain that placement without all of the help if you were not connected via you know, maternal grandma or paternal grandma. Um, actually, our grandparents disrupt far less frequently compared to placement rate than any other family type. And I think that makes sense when you think about why that might be. Um, but also the number one reason, the number one reason families say they disrupt is because they cannot control the behavior of the child. And then the other reasons that they're disrupting are the birth parents. So family dynamics can be so challenging and um, it, it, it's extremely challenging when you're trying and stepping in to care for a child and you're sort of getting all of the bullets and arrows at you for stepping in and trying to help. You're not often thanked by your family. Maybe you're being blamed by the parents for taking the child or for causing the problem. Um, so family dynamics are another reason why families say this is too challenging. Um, and then just some practical things, lack of getting childcare, having difficulty with just social support around them. Um, it, but really it's the behavior, 46% of the time they mention behavior, the child's behavior which points us back to the importance of training, because as we talked about, our training covers difficult behavior, trauma-informed understanding of the brain, how to parent differently for a child who's experienced trauma. So how are we going to help families think about getting the help that they need to avoid disruption down the road, while knowing that if we put too much training in the front end, we might increase the chance of disruption? I mean, these are just really big questions that we should be asking ourselves as we redesign our licensing systems to be more supportive for kin. So we think that pushing training at the beginning is probably not a good idea. We can look at the next slide. Um, but we need to start thinking through the length of the placement. So if there's a way that we can sort of sense, okay, this child may be in foster care four months or less, Maybe that caregiver doesn't need a huge amount of training on guardianship and adoption because that's not something that's going to be considered for that case. Maybe they don't need a lot of information on big behaviors because in four months that child is returning home. Um, but for our long-term families, we know that they do need all that information, especially if they're going to be the permanent resource for the child. They're going to need assistance learning how to um, parent a child who's experienced trauma, abuse, and neglect. 
So if we put this all together, we put it all together from our data and from what we've done in the years since, we know that right now about 53% of families receive training and that training is coming because it's mandatory. It's sort of a forced part of licensing. It's that stick piece, but they're receiving it even though if they wouldn't take it on their own, almost 100% of them say it was helpful and they would recommend it to others. But we also know that only approximately six to 10% of families will take training voluntarily. And we have some quotes here from our survey um, that outline what families actually said. If we say, if it's voluntary, would you take training? And they said, I was upset about having to take training, but the end, I loved it, it helped me so much, but I don't know if I would have taken it voluntarily. I think training is important. Um, shocking how trauma can affect kids and I don't believe the average person knows how to really care for them. And then finally, if training wasn't required, I would not have taken them, but I learned so much from them, how to deal with trauma, how to break the generational cycle of bad parenting, better parenting skills and so much more. I think they need to be required. So families are saying that should be required, but they're also saying they wouldn't take it if it wasn't. Um, so we need to make sure that when we're rethinking licensing requirements, I know a lot of um, states and jurisdictions are thinking of dropping training requirements. If right now we're increasing stability because families have access to training and it's mandatory, but when we drop it, less families or fewer families will receive training, it might impact stability down the road because the number one reason families are, are disrupting is behavior. We need to think through, yes, we need training, but when, when do we need training? So the timing of support is so critical. At the beginning, at the front end, it's so clear that families just need a safe place to land. Families need to know that they are in a place that is safe, um, that is not necessarily the government, um, that is, you know, I think a big piece of the reason foster kinships model works is we don't have badges, we are not CPS. We're able to, most of us have lived experience and say, hey, we understand where you're coming from and we know how we can help and we hope that you trust us so we can get you to a place that feels better. Um, so at the beginning, families just need to feel supported. But as the um, duration of care goes on, families do need trauma-informed training to care for the, the issues with family dynamics and especially with the behavior of the children. So there is a need for training, but putting it too close to the beginning of the crisis could actually make some things worse. So how we're thinking about it now is we're basically prioritizing equity, with getting families through a process quickly, access to financial support by taking down a lot of barriers, but still thinking through stability long-term by timing interventions for families based on the length of time children are in care and the potential outcome. So if a family is gonna be the permanent uh, home for that child, absolutely there needs to be a lot more support for that family's journey than for a family that's stepping up for a period of a few weeks or a few months and that child is returning home quickly. Thinking through the dynamics of short and long-term foster care needs is really, really important. Um, it's not gonna be one size fits all. We know that Navigator kind of helps all situations, but for the other interventions, it's all about timing. So I will pass it on, I think, Leah, to um, some of our ideas. Yes. So as we rethink kinship licensing and think about what should it look like in terms of optimizing, you know, stability and safety um, and nurturing parenting, um, this is what we've come up with. Um, so I'll kind of go through our um overarching kind of goals in terms of it being mandatory, right? We need kinship specific topics that are relevant to the caregiver and relative to their specific needs um, and family dynamics, the kiddos in their care, um, a customized training schedule. Our caregivers can't, you know, always take trainings at normal business hours. So ensuring there's you know, different um, times for them to attend training. Um, we utilize a cohort model so families can build a bond with one another, um, lean on each other for emotional support. And a lot of the bonds that are created in our classes are like lifelong bonds and they maintain friendships. Their kiddos have friendships with each other. And it's, it's really beautiful that they have each other as support because kinship care can feel incredibly isolating. We offer hybrid style classes, which we think should continue because not all caregivers can come in person, right? Sometimes they don't have enough seats in their cars to transport all of their kiddos to our classes. 
Um, sometimes, you know, it's just easier. Maybe they have an immunocompromised kiddo or they themselves are immunocompromised as caregivers. Um, so we really need to have flexible options for them. But for caregivers who do learn better in person or maybe just want a little bit of a break, we have childcare. So their kiddos can be, you know, getting support and services with our child care specialists while we're working on social and emotional development, um, while our caregivers are getting what they need in their licensing classes. So um, what this looks like, steps one through seven, is essentially after placement with the caregiver um, or at placement, there's a home safety check and, of course, their background check. Um, we would recommend, you know, if possible, having both background checks done for placement as well as licensing done in the beginning just to kill two birds with one stone. Um, and that caregiver is approved for placement. Um, right after that, we do think caregivers should attend an orientation, a kinship foster care 101, right? Foundations and safety. So they know all of the important information that they need. Um, a lot of feedback that we receive is caregivers don't learn basic boundaries and how to work with the child welfare system until they're in our classes, which is sometimes a month or two or three after they've taken placement, right? Because it's not mandatory for them to be licensed. So sometimes caregivers take a little bit longer to get to that point. Um, and so we really think it's important to give them, you know, specific and targeted information that they need to know at the beginning. After that, we'll follow up with a kinship navigator um, intake and assessment to see what their needs are as a family, how we can support them in achieving and maintaining stability. Those families will then be referred to our case managers who will support them in achieving that stability. They will um, create a case plan that is tailored to the caregiver's needs, um, as well as their kiddos' needs, and um, support them through hopefully this very quick licensing process, but also so the family knows we're still there for them even after this hopefully quick process is complete. Um, our caregivers will be signed up for family-specific pre-service training. So there are some trainings, right, or modules that all caregivers should go through, right? What is, you know, the child welfare system look like? What are permanency options? Um, but other caregivers have provided feedback that they would like training that is specific to the needs of their family. So caregivers who, you know, don't have infants or kids in car seats, right, don't have to take car seat, but maybe they want teen specific training. Um, and how do we best engage our teens and work with our teens so they can achieve stability, especially our kids who may age out of the system. Um, so our caregivers will have electives of sorts that they can choose from that are specific to their needs and um, what they think their needs are. Um, we hope uh, by the time training is done, their background results will be back, as we know that sometimes takes a little while, um, but hopefully, you know, over the eight hours of training that our families um, will go through, the results will be back, and then we're also hoping concurrently a licensing worker is completing um, an assessment or home study of sorts um, to really meet with a family to, you know, talk about, you know, um, what needs they may have from the Department of Family Services and just maintaining being a licensed foster parent. And once those are complete, the caregiver is a licensed foster parent. Um, you know, we really want this to be specific to our families and what they're telling us is training is needed. So by removing all requirements, I think we would really um, have kids perhaps be less safe and less stable in their homes. Um, I'd also, like to, yes. Oh. Can I just jump in? Sorry, Leah. I think the biggest things that we're thinking about as we're working in partnership with our state to revamp this whole process is we want to get rid of all of the unnecessary barriers and hoops that families are currently having to jump through, um, which is the majority of that paperwork, the majority of the home study um, process with, you know, looking at beds and looking at square footage and things that are not culturally appropriate for families. Um, but we want to figure out how to get training in in a way that doesn't feel burdensome, that's not linked to a burdensome process, but that can be given in you know one on a one on one format with a family advocate in an orientation setting, um, and in these hybrid sort of elective options that are 100% tailored to what they're saying that they need to learn in the assessment, so that it feels very much just a natural part of here's what it is that you need. There's no check the box on this. This is going to be absolutely specific to what each family needs. 
customized and tailored to them as fast as possible to get them into that licensed stage. And then, as we talked about before, foster kinships programming is available throughout the whole lifespan of a, a family's journey. And so by building trust up front through Navigator Services in this crisis time, we hope that families will then electively decide, you know what, I really had a good experience with foster kinship before. Now I'm struggling six months in with some bigger behaviors. I remember they mentioned trauma-informed training. Maybe I will take that TBRI series that they offer because I know I can get free childcare and that they care about me. So that's really our goal and our plan um, is to get them through fast, make it very tailored, um, partner and, and work with the state of Nevada to drop most of the requirements right now, but to consider how families need different information at different points of their journey and to just tailor something to each family. So that's my pitch. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. I'd love to open it up for questions now. If anybody has questions about anything that we've discussed, our programs, our data, or how we are rethinking this licensing process. Um, let's see. So somebody asked, what strategies could be implemented to ensure that caregivers receive the necessary training and support to effectively care for children with trauma and behavioral challenges? I will let Allie answer that. So I think one thing that we've learned um, from the Navigator program is that families are very open and receptive to receiving information uh, that is necessary. Once there's trust built with our family advocates and with our team. So, you know, just, you know, assigning a class or just providing a pamphlet of information is never going to work. Um, we need to make sure that all of the information provided to improve outcomes for children and the caregivers ability to be safe, to be stable and to be nurturing needs to come through relationship. That's why a navigator model works is because it's relationship-based, it's emotional support, it's hospitality, um, and it's peer support walking alongside. And so we feel that the most effective way to get families the information that they truly need is to first build that relationship, to have families feel safe enough to disclose what's really going on in their homes. And all of us who are living this, like we know, we know how hard it is. And also it's kind of scary to tell a stranger what's really going on in your home. Um, so really making sure that uh, families have a relationship, feel safe to ask, and then they're going to receive the information, however it's provided, they'll receive it better once that relationship is built. So my bias will always be that kinship navigation services are a critical part of all of our work with kin. The child welfare agency should work with a navigator program. Every state should have a navigator program that can build this safe relationship so that all of the good information and evidence that we have about increasing child well-being can be given and delivered in a way that can be received and utilized. I hope does that answer the question? I lost it. Yes, no, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, the next question we have is what potential benefits and drawbacks of requiring a more detailed and mandatory orientation for kinship caregivers at the beginning of the placement process? Um, I'll go ahead and answer this one. I think the benefits of having caregivers attend a mandatory orientation is that they're hearing all the information almost again that hopefully the caseworker has already told them. What we found is caregivers after placement, I mean, they're in such high stress dealing with a true crisis, right? Not only do they have you know kiddos in their home now, they're managing different dynamics within their families and they're trying to get you know kids in school to the doctor. They have so many things and I'm sure their minds are just scrambled and it's very hard to remember when you are in you know a heightened state of stress and probably shock with what they're dealing with. And so a benefit is they get to hopefully hear the information again or for the first time, right? And so they know their rights and responsibilities for caring for a kiddo in the foster care system. Um, and they know what they're basically opting into by caring for a child in the system. Um, because there is going to be, you know, requirements. Um, hopefully they're going to be simpler, right? And faster requirements that they have to go through. But it's just so important that they get the information. You know, a drawback is, of course, it's, you know, another thing that they have to do, but it could be detrimental if they don't get the information in terms of them maintaining placement or maintaining safety for the child. Can I just it, add another thing yeah. too about this is families that have gone unlicensed in Nevada, 
oftentimes will interact with foster kinship and training at the very end because there is a requirement that they take training in order to adopt. So sometimes two, two and a half years into their kinship journey, they're finally for the first time um, receiving training and information from the classes. And the number one thing that we hear is, I can't believe no one told me this in the beginning. I don't feel it was fair that I'm just learning this now. I had no idea what my options were. And so foster kinship wants to just make sure that families have accurate information at the right time, and then they can make the best decision for their family. Um, but when we're not presenting accurate information to families at the right time, the feedback we receive is that wasn't fair. I needed to know this sooner. What a lot of like time lost. So that's the feedback from families who get it after the fact. Thank you, Allie. Someone added that orientations are a great idea, but it takes the edge off and gives families some ideas of what to expect. Exactly. Um, a next question that we have is, how do you collaborate with other professionals or recommendations for collaboration and agencies and stakeholders to ensure a holistic approach to child welfare? Paula, would you like to take this question? Yes, I can answer that one. Yeah, so that word holistic, right, that we want to look at the, the entire family, not just the caregiver and the child, but also parents too. We want to make sure that there's services for them as well. And so we kind of take a tiered approach of first making sure that we are recognizing the stability needs. So for example, we have two on-site DWSS workers at our office that is that's an incredible partnership. It makes a huge difference for our families because we can do in-depth applications with them and then they can do an interview for, you know, child only TANF, fictive kin TANF, SNAP at our office. And, you know, the DWSS workers that are stationed there have now become incredibly familiar with kinship families. So they are kind of kinship experts in themselves as well. And so that's one way of focusing on stability is what do these what do families need immediately to make sure that right now they're okay? And once we're able to stabilize them, then looking at the healing needs, how do we make sure that they have training and education to safely and properly care for their children? And so that's where we have, um, we have an incredible partnership with a mental health agency here in Las Vegas who provides um, on-site mental health service assessments to our families. And we're actively working on reducing barriers to other uh, mental health services here in Las Vegas, especially, for example, if kiddos potentially have ASD or FASD and they need a different type of assessment that may not be readily accessible or affordable, we want to make sure that we're developing partnerships with our local community so that, you know, our partners also recognize that kinship families need help and they need it in a timely manner to make sure that children are safe. Um, so that's an example of more of the healing services. And then also zooming out to kind of the macro level, I mentioned briefly earlier that we also do a lot of policy work. So we make sure that we have a group of um, uh, focus groups for teens to talk about their experiences in kinship and foster care, um, as well as for our caregivers to talk about what the experience has been like for them. And with their feedback, they identify the policy agenda of what doesn't work, what do they wish was implemented, and how can we really advocate that on you know a local, state, and federal level. And so making sure we're, again, just looking at the immediate stability also healing, and then big picture system change. Thank you, Paula. Our next question, will some trainings or trainings be pre-recorded and offered to families to participate and complete those trainings at their leisure, such as hybrid courses? Absolutely. We think that's really important. Um, we already offer that for some of our classes, such as CPR or car seat, because we understand for a CPR class, that's four hours in a room that sometimes caregivers can't do all at one time. So by offering hybrid options, it allows them to break it up. Um, it allows them to do it from the comfort of their own home. Um, so we will absolutely be including hybrid options for families because it just increases that equity for them to access it. 
And I think this is our last question. Um, I saw something on the first slide about practice informed policy. Can you elaborate on that a little? And I will pass it to Ali, if you don't mind to answer this. I don't mind at all. I'm laughing because it's such a nice call out. But um, some of you know that I've done my academic work in kinship care as well and in non parental care. And what I find when I'm on the academic side of things is that a lot of the research that exists on families and kinship care is not specific enough based on my practice knowledge to actually answer the questions that we have on the ground. So for example, a lot of the research on the differences between kinship care and foster care outcomes don't even acknowledge the fact that kinship foster care exists, which is an overlap, or they're maybe not identifying is this child that they're looking at in kinship care outside the system or inside the system and comparing outcomes to foster care. And it has that sort of confusing part about the foster care system intervention. So using our practice um, knowledge, which we know there's a lot of kinship family types and the outcomes are looking different. It's not fully in line with the research. We want our practice to inform the research agenda on kinship care and then the research to sort of flow into making sure our practice is the very best. So it's really just a a loop of practice and um, research that will inform the best policies for us moving forward. So that's what Foster Kinship tries to do. Um, we're kind of straddling our the academic research side and the actual practice side, and we want to bring the knowledge we have from being in both fields to the rest of the um, both the academics and our other practitioners across the country. So that's what that means. Thank you so much, Ali. And thank you all for attending today. We really appreciate you, you know, coming here to hear our ideas about thinking, rethinking the licensure process to make it faster and simpler for relatives, but also optimizing safety and stability and nurturing parenting. Um, our contact information is on the slide that's been up. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, after this, I will follow up with an email with just our briefing that includes this um, data and information. And if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you.